This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Here is a hippo just sitting outside of Riatilla Dam. So let's get ready, get your questions ready, and let's go on safari. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome aboard. Like we said earlier, this hippo is a little bit warm, I think, now. Trying to warm up after a very cool morning. Hello, everyone. My name is Trishala with Darby on camera this afternoon. It's a very nice 23 degrees Celsius to 73 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that this hippo is taking advantage of that heat. It must be quite cold in that water. There it is. Welcome aboard to all our kids. Remember, you can send your kids' questions to kidsquestions at wildearth.tv and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Now, we're down this way because apparently there were some alarm calls. So we're going to try and follow up. And then we saw this little critter. Well, not so little critter, quite large critter. outside of the water. Oh, we're trying to get comfy. It's quite nice to see a hippo out of the water because so often we sit in the water and we don't get to see just how large the body is. Now, males can get up to three tons, which is huge. Females about half that weight. Oh, isn't this, this is just wonderful. Get to see the whole body. Hi, Zara, you're eight years old. You'd like to know how much a hippo weighs? Well, males do get between two and three hands. That's thousands, so two and three thousand kgs, and females are about a thousand four hundred, thousand two hundred kgs when they're adults. So they're quite large. Oh, hello, tiny little grebe. You better get out of the way. If that's the little bird that's in front in the water. You better get out the way because the hippo's going to get back into that water. Look how, look how clumsy they look when they're walking on land. You wonder how do those little legs, such short legs, support its body? Well, it doesn't have to do it too much and they do a pretty good job. It'd be very difficult for you or I to outrun a hippo on land. They can run at full speed at about 36 kilometers per hour. Just to put that into some perspective, Usain Bolt runs at about 44 kilometers per hour. So you and I, we're gonna have some trouble outrunning this hippo. Well, it's going to slink into the water now, and watering holes are going to be a great place to hang out, especially since it's warmed up. So I'm going to send you over to Steve, also on Juma, who's at a watering hole, and we can all say good afternoon, Steve. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all of you. Water is a currency of life. And there we've got some starlings and a black collared barbet. Come down to drink. 
with their reflections in the water. What a wonderful scene. If you want to find hippos, you go to the water. If you want to find many other animals, you can stake them out at the water as well because the water is the currency of life and like you and I, everybody has to drink. So hello everybody, my name is Steve, joined by BK on camera. Welcome to the afternoon safari. And I'm sure Trishala has already spoken to you about the questions. We are going to focus on birds again today and look at some ecological adaptations and functions and in general, how animals fit into the system. First of all, a very big word called habitat. There's a crested barbet on the right now, BK. You can see the other barbet. There, two barbets have come down. There we go. There's a crested. Look how wonderful he is. Crested barbet. The greater blue-eared starlings, as well as the black-collared barbet. Now, habitat. What is habitat? Habitat is an area an organism has to live in, sleep in, access to food, access to water, and place for their babies. Now, what's very interesting is all of these birds that you're looking at at the moment rely on cavities in the trees for nesting. Cavities in trees, which is very important to talk about because there are many, many trees around in the savannah. And certain animals need to make the holes in the tree for them. And woodpeckers, as well as barbets, like that one there, are able oh, to do so. Just behind me here, I can hear some oxpeckers as well, which are also hole-nesting birds. I'll tell you when I can see them, BK, but for now they're just in the tree. So habitat for these birds, clearly they need water. They need trees for nesting and insects as well as fruit as form of food. So if you eliminate any of those sort of things, that habitat becomes unsuitable and those animals will have to move away. Oh, Beaks, look, we've got our mouse birds again on top of that bush. Red-faced mouse birds. There they are. <laughs> We thought we'd come again to this watering hole and see what birding we can see. It's always nice to spend some time at a watering hole. That's why most camps in the Kruger National Park, if you go to, will, there'll be a watering hole outside. And everybody always goes and hangs out at watering holes for hours, especially if you're a bird watcher. You always have the potential of anything coming down to drink. Any animal, leopard, lion, rhino, Elephants are always a great one. And well, if it's a big enough watching hole, you'll most certainly find a hippopotamus. Okay, well, it sounds like Dylan in Tualu Kalahari is up and mobile, and he'd like to say good afternoon. Welcome back, everyone. Good to have you with us. Um, for those of you who haven't met us yet, at Swala Kalahari, it's just another beautiful afternoon. The wind has died down. It's warm for a change compared to this morning. We were, it was quite nippy this morning. Those of you who actually were with us, you would have seen we had a little ice tray that we put out, and it actually froze over in the half an hour, 40 minutes that we left it on the ground. So join us this afternoon. We've got some fun things that I want to chat with you about. The first one being, you'll notice, you know, in the time that you've spent with us, most of the sequences that, that we, or areas that we've been driving and that we've been doing has been on like open sand, okay? So what is really striking about this particular area that we're looking at now is you'll notice all the rocks. So you're like, ah, okay, well, so how do these rocks come about? Where are they from? And why are they all in this very, very small area around here? This area that we're looking at is probably 100 square meters, maybe, maybe a little bit larger, give or take. Um, so how do, how do they end up here? And we're saying, well, the hills are close by here, but still it doesn't account for all these little pebbles and, that, and, and slightly larger rocks lying around over here. 
And actually, when you start looking closer, this becomes really, really fascinating. So we've got a lot of stones here that actually have been worked by people. And when I'm saying worked, I'm t and when I say people, it's actually what we call the MSA, the Middle Stone Age, going into Late Stone Age. Um, and you know, we, we, some of these stones that work, and I'll show you better examples as I, as I move towards you there. We're looking at a time frame roughly, give or take, 250,000 years, right through to probably the past three, 4,000 years. Um, but how we distinguish these, and I'm looking as I'm like ambling along here, I'm gonna kind of crawl towards the camera. I'm looking for some really, really nice examples. But pretty much, in a nutshell, everything that you're seeing here in this area has at some point been handled by uh, early modern man, or perhaps, in fact, definitely even, um, you know, pre-modern human. So we're talking about like probably Homo erectus, um, even maybe Homo gast, although that's a little bit earlier. Um, but this is really, really cool. So there you can see Jandre just panning around there a bit. Um, so what we're seeing is a lot of, this is pretty much all quartzite. Um, it's a very hard, fine-grained rock. It's very, very coarse fracturing, and I'm looking for some good examples as I'm, as I'm sitting here talking to you about it, um, of actual flakes um, that, they, that they were actually using on these. I'm just gonna come forward. Yeah, here's, a, here's a good example over there. Typically, but not always, you've got these three faces to it. Jandre, you can you see that okay? Eh? So you've got that one, two, three faces, and then on the top here, you've got what we call a striking platform. So that striking platform, they would have used other stones to actually take these flakes off. And you could have, they could have actually used this itself as the tool, or the flakes that actually came off here would have been incredibly fine and very, very sharp. And that's what, um, what would have also been used, particularly as you go more towards the later Stone Age, the more recent stuff. Those are, the, those are the kind of sharp flakes that they would have been using. Here's, a, here's an example of what's called a core stone. I'm looking if I can actually get a better example for you. So these core stones are typically a lovely disc shape. This one seems to be a bit fractured on the back end over here. But a core stone, if I can find a good one, it's kind of disc shaped like that, and then it's got multiple fractures, flakes that have been taken off all around. There. Oh, yeah, actually, here's something else. Okay, so that's a core stone. So this is actually now very, very interesting. And I see there's a couple other pieces. I'm just going to come a little bit further forward over there. Just bear with me a little bit. I'm going to put it, them down on here so you can actually see them better. There's one example, and here is a, a stunningly good example of what we call late Stone Age. It's more like a microlith. Um, let me just position that over there so you can see that clearly. Actually, I'll turn it a little bit like that in the light. So what you're looking for on these, so what these are more what we call Oh, we got some hippos running into the water. Quick link to one of our colleagues. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to those that tuned in with us in the morning. We are again out and about, and we're studying with a very two nice hippos in the water hole. My name is Barry again. I have Owen behind me as a cameraman, and we have started with these two big hippos that were lying just, just on the edge of the water as we arrived here. As we all can remember, this morning was about six degrees down here. It's midday, it warmed up to about 23 degrees, so these hippos took an opportunity of sand bathing just lie outside to get themselves warm and yeah of course when they are on land not so used to vehicles and us as soon as we get here they wanted to flee back into their safe heaven which is back in the water hole you can still see you have the body of one walking towards us from still from a quite far off distance most likely to spend another hour or so in the water and then they're gonna maybe start heading out to go graze for the evening. But as we are all aware how cold it gets these days in the evening, 
I think it was a great idea they had of sitting outside. Look at the one on the background. He's busy opening his mouth as he walks towards us. A little bit of a threatening gesture there, still from far off distance, but he's showing his big canines as he walks towards his mate there. You can see the one in the front is gone. Yeah. Taylor, from this distance, looking at the sizes, he, one is much bigger than the other, so I will assume that he's a male and a female, but it's not too clear from where we are. But it's not often that you find two males together, and both of them will be two. <clears throat> too big to be both females. The one at the back was definitely a male. So yeah, I'll agree with you. I'll think they're both males. A male and a female, sorry. So as the sepals are going down fully submerged to go spend a little bit of time before they will head away in an hour's time or more out and about for the evening, we will hand you over to Trish. And she's another got another water drilling animal. Indeed it is something else resting up at the water side. It is a Nile or water monitor. It's trying to get some sun. Now it quite likes this fallen over tree. Hangs out here quite a bit. And I think it's a great spot to sunbathe. And after the last couple cool days, all the reptiles will really be trying to collect as much energy from the sun as possible. Doesn't he look like a statue? Looks like it's holding on for dear life, but it's actually just trying to spread its body out so it can collect as much sunlight as possible. So it needs to expose as much of itself to the sun as possible. Now look at that tail. It's quite a long tail. Now that entire length, which generally for a water monitor is about a meter, maybe even 1.2 meters. And that tail is flattened so that it can work a bit like a rudder in the water. It's got this lovely black and yellow coloration. Some good claws for digging and finding eggs. What one is his love? Love crocodile eggs especially. They'll dig them out from the nearby banks and eat them. Walking for us. I love the way that they walk and look at that tongue sticking out. It's got a forked tongue. And it's tasting the air as it walks. Isn't it just marvelous? Now tongues of reptiles are forked because it having that fork allows the animal to determine where that scent is coming from that it's picking up with its tongue. Whether it's detecting it mostly on the right part of the fork or the left part of the fork. And then it can use that information to determine where it wants to go. Maybe there's some food. showing you another good reason for those long claws and that's to climb 
It's very steady as it moves along. Now it's looking down at something in the water. Sue, you'd like to know if it's a full-grown monitor lizard? Sue, I think given its size, so a full-grown monitor lizard is about 1.2 meters. But they can get much larger. They can actually get to about two meters. So the rock monitor gets a little as to a smaller length than this one. That's the two types of monitors that we get here. And I'd say that this one is fully grown. And they're fully grown about 1.2. This one I would say is about I'd say it's about that length. I always use myself to measure. I'm 1.58. And it is, I'd say about maybe 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters less than my height. Lovely. I'm so glad that we could see it actually move along as well. Just stunning. All right, well, I am not the only one that's having a party. I'm having a reptile party here. Steve is having a bird party, and he had a special invitation, so let's go over. We are indeed, and uh, sorry, we've got some white-crested helmet trikes flittering around there. And they've decided to go hard from us in that big marula at the back. Hopefully they'll come back. They're a very pretty bird. There we go. You can see one in the middle. They feed primarily on insects, spiders, even small lizards, and they occur in a small group. We call that cooperative breeding. A group of them will uh, live together, and there will only be one female who lays the eggs, and they all help with the rearing of the chicks. And they use a spider web to make the nest. So that's another adaptation that some birds can have to more hands, or should I say more beaks, to feed the chicks means higher chance of success than if it's just a pair feeding the chicks. If something happens to one of the individuals in a pair, like with these starlings or that go away bird, then there's a very good chance that the chicks might not do well. The go air bird, but they've also been known to cooperatively breed. Basically, what that means in some birds is it means that they sometimes the chicks will stick around from the season before to help mum and dad with the new chicks. Where is see, look at him just hopping through. Go to hear the quack go away bird. Now, they feed on fruits and seeds and leaves, and especially new shoots of flowers and leaves that come through. Very well adapted to the woodland that we have here. As are most of the birds we see around here. We're looking at habitat preference. We'd we'll be talking about the acacias or the broadleafed woodland that we're currently in. The Afrikaans name is called the Kwe Kwe Fool, which means that exactly Kwe Kwe Fool. Fool is Afrikaans for bird. <laughs> it's a very descriptive name. Come on, give us another one. That beak designed for, for breaking harder fruits. Also can pick at flowers quite easily. Beak adaptation. It's like your hands. We've designed tools to allow us to do the job. Birds have evolved their beak into different structures and shapes so as to help them specialize against other birds. And that is how they survive. If you don't specialize, you have to migrate. Many of the birds that migrate, pretty much all of them, are all insect eaters. So they're here for our summer when there's lots of insects. There you can see the size comparison between the starling 
lots of insects. And then they leave, go back to, to the northern hemisphere to feed on the insects there with the rainy season. But it's a very difficult journey. Some birds have to pick up 50% of their weight so as to be able to do the journey, which is basically fuel. Okay, well, we're going to stay right here. I'm going to send you over to Trish. She's got some elephants on the move. They are on the move, and they're moving quite quickly. Now, that's interesting because... There could be a leopard in this drainage, and we suspect so, but we haven't heard any calls just yet, any alarm calls, or any clues. But these guys are bunched together. Can you see that? The little ones protected by the older, larger adults. And moving quite quickly. So that could be a sign that they didn't see anything, but something didn't feel right in that drainage. I'm just going to back up because there are two stragglers. I'll just turn behind us so we can have a look. Hello, gorgeous. So this is a, a male in about his early teens. And he would have recently been a deprioritizer from his, from his herd. That tends to happen at this age and they'll start to be pushed out. So that's why he would be lagging behind. Here we have a youngster. Hello, lovely. You can see the little tusks are starting to poke out. That starts to happen between two and three years old. You can actually see that the right tusk is poking out a little more than the left tusk. We can't have all have even teeth now, can we? And it's just alongside mum there. Hi, Tesla. Happy birthday. I believe it's your birthday today and you have an, a really awesome question. You'd like to know how far can a herd of Elias move in a day? Well, they can constantly be moving. They can move the entire day. And also it depends on the rate at which they move. But they can travel tens of kilometers in a day. Remember, Elias will only sleep for a short portion, just a few hours in a day. And that's actually at most. And they have proper sleep where they can lie down and have REM sleep or sleep when you're dreaming, deep sleep, only for a few minutes. So if for all of the other hours of the day, they're busy traveling, it can be tens of kilometers. I'm just going to turn so we can get another look. They're moving quite quickly. Well, I'm going to try to keep up, but my friend Taylor has an elephant as well. So let's go over and see. Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. I just jumped off the car for two seconds. But yes, here we are sitting with an elephant. And I'm so happy that we are able to show it to you this afternoon. It seems as though he was having a little bit of a scratch. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Gert. And we are sitting here on Pridelands right at the Eco Training Camp. And look at what we've got in front of us. We've actually had lots of activity today coming down towards the dam. We have had buffalo, we've had some inyala. We have had, of course, so many elephants coming around to see us today. And that is probably one of the elephant's favorite scratching posts. You can see how they've pushed that tree down. 
sometimes it's a bit of an obstacle, especially for the smaller elephants. But when you're that size, it actually makes for the perfect post to scratch your belly. Isn't that fantastic? Again, this is probably one of the younger bulls that we've seen a couple of times. Oh, look at that one. All the dust going up over there. Oh, sorry, we've got a big lead wood in the way, but I'm too afraid to move. Um, chance elephants obviously are enormous. It's in their genetics to grow to this size, so they, they need to eat a lot of food. So one elephant, you know, needs to eat 5% of its body weight every single day. So a fully grown elephant bull is eating anywhere between 150 and 250 uh, kilograms of vegetation every single day, maybe even a little bit more. At this time of the year, they might actually have to eat a bit more than that because it, it, it's coming into winter. So the, the food is not as nutritious. And their body allows them to, I suppose, digest all the proteins and carbohydrates and all those types of things that they get from um, plants and they can grow so large. I reckon if we had the same genetics as an elephant, can you imagine how much food we'd have to eat as people? We'd also be eating all day long. But because they've got such poor digestive systems, they have to eat such large amounts too. But it's all just in their genetics. I like that this elephant is now resting its leg. It must be quite comfortable. You just put a foot up every now and then and feed. What are you eating though? I'm trying to figure out what it little trubbids feeding on. There's a couple of different types of weeds growing underneath the fallen trees there, but I can't really see what they are. And seeing as though we can see the elephant's foot quite nicely. And Maddox, this answers your question. Not all elephants will have exactly the same size foot. It depends, of course, on their age. So if an elephant is small, it's going to have a smaller foot. Um, and they all have different shapes and sort of, um, and, and sizes. So not all elephant cows get to four tons or not all elephant bulls get to five and a half tons. Um, so depending on their weight and their height, I think that that would also play a role to how big that their feet can get. But they're fairly large. What we'll do is we'll see if we can find a nice elephant footprint in the sand and see if I can stand in it. I definitely will be able to stand in it. Normally I can put both my feet in an elephant's footprint. I would have loved to have measured uh, Ezelweenie's uh, footprint. He's a big tusker we saw a few days ago to try and get how tall he is. But this is very nice. I'm sure the buffalo bulls that we saw this morning will come down for a drink. They did ponder around here this morning. They didn't stay for very long, and then they moved off. And I did see their tracks when we were out that side a little bit earlier. So... There's no hippos here, unfortunately. I'm waiting for the return of the hippopotamus that lives in this dam. But Aspen, who is only six years old, you've asked, how do elephants and hippopotamuses breathe underwater? So they actually can't breathe underwater because they're like us. They're like mammals. So they don't have gills. Um, they have to hold their breaths. For a hippopotamus, they're able to hold their breath for up to six minutes. Imagine being able to sit at the bottom of the pool and not come up for air for six minutes. So that's what they do. Now, elephants have got a very, very special adaptation. You see that long thing hanging from their face, Aspen? That's called a trunk. And that trunk is very useful for a number of different reasons. And it kind of is very helpful for what... Um, you were just asking. So elephants are good swimmers. They actually can swim exceptionally well and they'll go in deep water where their feet can't even touch the bottom anymore. Then what they need is a, um, they need to use their trunks. So they'll use their trunks like a snorkel. You know, if you go uh, to the beach and you want to look at the fish, you put your mask on, your goggles, and then you have a snorkel in your mouth that allows you to breathe while you're looking underwater. That's basically what the trunk does for an elephant. So it's like a nose, but it's also like an, extra, like an arm because it can use it to pick things up. It's very cool. I'd love to have a trunk. It would be very useful.
those, I think they are some vervet monkeys, but we're a little bit further away. I don't know if we're going to get a great view of them, but you might see some movement in the trees behind that elephant. We will see if we can find them. Right, seems like the elephants are moving off, so we will do the same thing. Off you go across to Tualu to see what Dylan is up to. Thanks for your patience there. The guys have been having some amazing sightings and absolutely fascinating stuff. Yeah, you know, about elephant foot sizes, like really interesting questions there. Um, but on our side, back to our inanimate objects. You know, Jandra and I have to do like a sand or a rock sequence at least once a day. So the question that Jandra has asked me now is coming back to the stones. Like, well, you see all these stones. Well, how do we know they're actually even worked by people? It's like, maybe it's just stones that have occurred here, they're worn out of the mountains. That's a brilliant question, one that raises a lot of, a lot of, you know, questions from any any person. So, well, well, how do you know this? So, there's a couple of key things here. Um, I won't get into too much detail, and anyone's obviously welcome to contact me if you want more info. Um, so, when you look at these, you've got this main surface over here, example, and then you've got multiple flakes, fractures that have been taken off on both sides over there. There, you've got the main surface area there. And again, multiple platforms or, you know, flakes that have been taken off. It's very unlikely that a, a stone will chip like that naturally. You can get what we call pet effects. So that's animals walking, chipping stones against each other, and you'll get flakes coming off, but not uniformly right around the edge of a core stone like that. Here's another example of a core stone. There you've got your main surface. And again, flakes that have been taken off. Now, you can also argue, well, because one of the things is they can use those flakes or they can use this as the tool. There's another example over there. You've had multiple flakes taken off over there. That's, a, that's from the main fracture area. So they would have had a boulder, chipped it, taken off a big piece, and then started reworking it. So this is more like late middle age, so no middle stone age, but the, the more recent stuff, it's very finely worked. Um, but now the question comes in leading on to Jandre's question is how do we know apart from like those kind of signs, that was people. Well, if you look over here, so this is where it gets interesting again. This, this material that you're seeing here, the, all this other stuff that we've been looking at is quartzite. It's a dime a dozen, all these hills are made of it. There's masses and they would never been able to use all of it, lots of it, lots of choice. This kind of stuff doesn't even occur on Swalu. Not to my knowledge is there any deposit that I'm aware of on Swalu. This would be, it's super, super, super fine grained, what we call jasperite. Um, gets incredibly sharp edges. And then you're moving over to this gorgeous butte of a stone over here. This is called chalcedony. This one would be like the gold standard. Those of you um, from the United States, there's those fantastic examples of arrowheads, those incredibly finely crafted arrowheads. Um, and this is generally or very often the material that they were making those from. To my knowledge, I think there's only about 13 arrowheads like that that have ever been found in South Africa. So very, very rare. Yeah, but the, the raw material is quite common in South Africa. So that like leads you on to, well, why did the technology develop there? Not yeah. But anyway, so looking at these, this would be of the, of the late Stone Age. In other words, the more recent stuff, this would be like kind of like the entry level stuff. There's big flags taken off there. This one is like more recent, and this would be the, the, the very, very recent stuff. In fact, they get even smaller, like a, a tenth of the size of this, sometimes smaller. And one reason why we can see this middle one is actually a nice example. When they flake it initially to get that super sharp edge for cutting stuff, then they've got to actually get like, try to get a serrated edge, and that's what we call secondary touch-ups. So they've actually been taking little chips out the edge over there, and that's what gives it that super sharp serrated edge. These ones are quite worn off now. Here's another nice example over there. Jean, I don't know how well you can see that, that little edge over there. But you had your major flake, and then you had all these tiny little serrations taken off through a process called pressure flaking. I can actually give a, not now, I'll, I'll get a piece of glass because it's just easier and I'm totally useless at it, but I'll give a, a really fun example of how to use pressure flaking to create um, stone tools. But Jean and I, we have something up our sleeve. That's going to take a little while to do. It won't be on this segment. Um, but anyway, so when you look at this landscape that Jean and I are driving around in and sharing with you, 
you know, you know, we can look at it in the context of, yeah, we here now, we're on a nice little game drive vehicle and we're seeing some animals, we've got all this modern equipment. But if you think how deep and how entrenched the human history is of these landscapes, that is something truly, truly, truly special. And then you also start realizing that, you know, we, we come here now and we're seeing these animals as a blip in time. It's just one little point on a long, 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 massive, huge graph. And that human history runs so deep and is so inextricably linked with these landscapes. And pretty much doesn't matter where you go in the world, but um, certainly Africa and even more so Southern Africa as a cradle of mankind um, with pretty much no dispute over that anymore. It's just, it's amazing you know where we are today and where we came from that, that's very very special um but in terms of animals something completely different um okay we're gonna we're gonna link so i'm not getting we're gonna link across to the low felt quickly uh, to our colleagues there i think they've got something special and we will be right back oh look at what we've got up a tree here beautiful looking straight at you can you see that it's a female leopard looks like she got successful midday sometimes she has got an impala carcass up a tree that she's busy feeding on if you look slightly low as Owen zooms in you'll see the whole body down there she's done a great job of actually killing this impala and managing to take it up a tree on time because when we get here there was a hyena right on the base who, who was taking some scraps on the ground and kept on looking up to try and see if he can get a little bit more of that. And if it wasn't for the fact that it's up a tree, after all the hard work, the hyena is back down. You can see it's on the ground as Owen zooms in. You can see where the hyena is. If you look Directly up of there, the hyena is sniffing around and looking for bones that falls off as this leopard is busy feeding. See that? It's hoping hard, as excuse me, as she looks up, hoping that maybe something will drop. And hyena, if you look at how powerful that neck is looking, much, much more bigger body compared to the leopard itself. One on one. The hyena will definitely win a fight against the hyena. So that is why a leopard has done a smart thing by taking that carcass up a tree. Because after all the hard work, if it wasn't the smart thing that is done, this hyena would have stolen that carcass already. Cool, so we are going to send you to Steve to go have a look at the bed. We'll talk to you shortly about this leopard. Mm, we're going to try. Sorry, everybody. The bird has moved behind the bush. Let's see if we can get it again. It's like a red-crested cohorn. One of our very, very camouflaged birds. We got him, BK. We might get him through this gap here. You got him? Can I stop? I can't see him. Oh, there we go. Very camouflaged. I think it's a Kohan. Haven't been able to look at the belly yet, or the chest properly. Invisible, isn't it? <laughs> He's watching us. <laughs> Hello, Joshua. You want to know what the rarest bird is in South Africa? Hmm, what is the rarest? I know that the Pell's fishing owl is very rare. Um, that's a good question. 
Pell's fishing owl is rare because it's lost a lot of its habitat. Um, the southern ground hornbills are also quite rare these days due to habitat loss. I was talking before. These go away birds are making the most amazing sound. Okay, let's quickly go back over to Barney and his leopard. Yeah, we just missed a fantastic thing that this leopard has just done. As she was busy feeding on that carcass, she made a mistake of and balancing it and the carcass almost fell onto the ground moved off to the branch but she was quick enough to be able to grab it and take it back up and the hyena was expecting to get something big but he got little scraps again so she's still happy up there she looks like she's been feeding for quite a while the belly is looking a little bit full you see the hyena taking the scraps on the ground again so I'm not sure I haven't got a clear fair ID of this leopard, but this territory that we are on in this eastern part of the territory right along the Timbavati River, it's a territory of a female leopard that we've named the Nyala female. Uh, how we every now and again give names to our animals, it's not just like a normal name like ours, it's a reference name. So Nyala female, when she was young, when she first got independent away from the mother, she there was a tree in the property called the Nyala tree that every time she left and went away she always came back into that particular area and for a few days to weeks we went to that area to look for fresh tracks most of the times we'll find her right there sometimes we'll find her fresh tracks moving away which kind of helped us to lead into tracking and finding her so now she is fully independent she actually has got a cub at the moment if it's her it is possible that it might not be here. Leopard's territories overlap quite well. We are not too far from our eastern boundary. So it could have been another animal that came from our neighbors in the east. However, if it is Nyala female, so she's carrying on feeding up in the tree we're gonna patiently wait for a while here see what unfolds because the belly is looking quite full so she might be starting to come down maybe to go find the cub so i'm gonna link you to trishala with an interesting bed and we might catch up a little bit later we are in the Mowati and we've got a brown hooded kingfisher and a black-headed oriole calling Very, very cool. Now, I love to look at kingfishers because they're just delightful. They're beautiful with those long beaks. And that lovely blue. Just stunning. Well, that's a nice way to wrap up our kids' drive. So, kids, please do stay on board if you'd like to see more wonderful animals. But everyone else, we invite you to send through your questions and comments using the hashtag WildEarth. And while you're in the mood for doing something, like sending us questions and comments, why don't you also go over to our support page and have a look at the things we do and why we do them and hopefully be able to help us and support us too because we enjoy very much being able to show you the big and the small out here in the African bush. Very curious kingfisher. I think that's what we shall name you, Curious Kingfisher. You see them in the Mowati quite a bit, and that's because the Mowati is just beautiful and has lots and lots of trees all around. And if you're a bird, what would you like? Trees. Trees is a good thing. There we go. You can see just how bushy it is. It's looking really nice with the rains that we've had this past season.
It's also a great place to hang out if, say, you were a leopard. So we've just been driving through to try and pick up on any sounds, any alarm calls, any tracks of a leopard. Oh, there's a Franklin going. Let's just, okay, I'll just wait for, to see what those Franklins were shouting about. Malik, you'd like to know if all animals have tails? All animals don't have tails. We don't have tails. Apes, in general, great apes don't have tails. Gorillas and chimps. What else doesn't have a tail? I'm thinking... Although I must say, it is a very common thing. Definitely. I mean, insects don't have tails. Generally, tail is to make sure that your anus is protected. Especially the case for other animals except birds, and birds need a tail for flight. Because we stand mostly upright, or great apes do tend to move in a kind of bipedal way, not like us who are totally upright. They do lack a tail too. All right, Swalu. Let me send you over to them. They're also doing a bit of birding. This is a fantastic sighting of, a, of an African pygmy falcon. It's the smallest falcon in Africa. Tiny, tiny, tiny little birds. And what is so, so awesome about these, and we'll actually, I'm going to show you one of their nests. I think some, I might have already done it before, very, very briefly, they nest inside the sociable weaver nest. Those massive nests we looked at yesterday, they nest inside those. Um, so this is really cool. And in terms of, uh, some of you may remember, we actually did that, that um, cobra release. So the cobras, and this is, this is how intricate these systems are, these birds only nest in sociable weaver nests. They will not use any other structure. Up in East Africa, they use a different, uh, they use one other species, one other white-browed buffalo weaver. But in Southern Africa, they only use sociable weavers. The cobras prey heavily on the sociable weaver, chicks and eggs. The nests where these falcons are found, okay, are three times less likely to have cobras in them they nest without pygmy falcons. So that, that, I mean, just look at that. So the, the catch for the weavers is this. Pygmy falcons also occasionally prey on social weavers. So I think it's like finding that balance of saying, well, okay, you know, we're going to tolerate the weaver and we score not having or, uh, the, uh, 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 a smaller likelihood of having cobras around. So there's always like these kind of trade-offs between these things. Um, yeah, so the weavers do derive benefit, but they also occasionally get predated. So this is a little female. You can see that beautiful russet patch on her back. And I'm hoping to see a male around here somewhere as well. So one of our, our long-standing researchers, Anthony Lani and, and Robert Thompson, they've been working on these pygmy falcons for a long, long time. And um, Anthony's actually just been awarded his PhD on it. And so there's some really interesting data on them. Um, but one of the very cool interactions is how um, the skinks living on the trees, if we see one, we'll actually point it out to, they actually react to alarm calls of birds in relation to pygmy falcons because these pygmy falcons will prey on lizards. Um, so they actually respond to alarm calls in the event there's a pygmy falcon around. And again, that's something you don't, you think, well, a lizard, well, okay, what's it gonna do with an alarm call? But they, you know, they're actually, I think a lot more intelligent than we actually give them credit for. Or, you know, depends what our measure of intelligence is, I guess. But it's so nice seeing these little guys, wow, and sitting right. And the other thing that I get great pleasure from is, is 
you know, Jandre is really, really enjoying his bird watching. Um, so to be able to like show him things like this is very, very special. And he's actually keeping a bird list. So we want to see how how long it gets by the end of these these next few weeks, next few months. Just what a special little bird. Eh? And you always, like, when you typically think of a bird of prey, you, know, you think of like an eagle or a big falcon, like a peregrine or a lanner or something. But these things are tiny, eh? Ah, Bonnie has a leopard. That's really, that should be a good sighting. I think head over there and we'll just spend a little bit of time with this pygmy falcon. Yeah, we still have this female. She just finished feeding. Moved to the closest branch. <coughs> the view is not clear at the moment, but I think, don't think she's going to be in that spot for too long. She's busy cleaning herself and looking around. ID confirmed it's Nyala female. So her looking around and cleaning herself like that. She might not necessarily be able to come down right now. Oh, the cub is just came into the picture on the other side of the tree. Oh, and can you see that? Moving just on the other side below the mother. You see that one? Look at the main stem now where we said the mother is going to go if she comes down. There the cub comes. So definitely Nyala female. And she is here with the cub. The cub just walk around across to the mother. The cub is going to walk past the mother to go also get to feed a little bit. It looks like the mother has fed for quite a bit and she looks like she's got a full belly. We just going to hope hard with a little bit of an inexperience from the cub that when she's busy feeding, there is a chance that she might ruin the moment here by maybe eating too much on the one side and find that the carcass is not balanced anymore. The hyena, we can't see her, or you can't see, but we know where she's lying down. She hasn't lost hope. She is right on the base of that tree. One mistake from that cub, that hyena will be up and about. It's amazing how great the camouflage of this leopard is. We've been sitting here for like 10 minutes. We only saw the mother until now when the baby started moving on the background. Even now that you know that they're there. Taylor made this cub. It's about nine, between nine and 10 months old. She yeah, was born late last year sometimes around september october so she is nine months old mark at the beginning when we first saw this from a distance we thought it was a baby impala but getting closer and having a closer look, we just reconfirmed that it's a bushbuck. Bushbuck is also one of the small antelope, size-wise not too small from an impala. The color looks slightly similar, but it, yeah, it's a different antelope. Or mug leopards, they can eat meat that has been off, have been off for a few days, and still it's not, it won't be a problem for them. Their immune system and stomachs is so strong with their stomach acid that they can be able to keep it in. Because sometimes, as you know, as great as they are as hunters, they sometimes not as successful as they want to be. So should they be walking around and find a dead carcass that has been dead for a few days, they will take that any time so as they are most of the other predators. Look, the mother looks like she is gonna come down the tree. She's just headed towards the main stem. Owen is gonna zoom and focus us in there because if she is to come down, that is gonna be quite quick. What is going to be interesting as she comes down is to see how the hyena is going to react as the hyena hears her hitting the ground as she comes down. Looks like she's changed the mind.
Selwyn, this particular carcass has been hoisted at least between 8 and 10 meters above the ground. And leopards can climb higher up in a tree quite easily. And looking at this carcass, it has been taken to the smaller branches possible. So when this mother was hosting this carcass, there is a good chance that this hyena was close by and was showing interest or running towards the tree. So she took it as far away as possible, just making sure that even if a hyena tries, doesn't manage to get there. I now on the move on the ground, maybe there are some small bones, fleshes that might have fallen onto the ground. It's really a big female hyena this. Laura, every situation is different depending on where the particular mother leopard. Some individuals I've seen in the past, they look after their babies until the 13, 14 months and they will leave them. I've seen individuals that will differentiate between a female cub and a female cub it's about 18, 20 months that the mother will let it be and start being independent because they are a direct competition for food, mating, and other things. And I've also seen in that same aspect, females tend to keep their young male babies slightly longer. They can keep them up to about two years at times, but every single situation is different. And it depends on a lot of things, the availability of food, the competition of other predators in the area, danger, a whole lot of things that get considered when that decision is to be made by the mother leopard. It is actually a great question, Edina. Yes, the leopard's coat will help the leopard to survive, in particular if a baby leopard is still quite young. So when baby leopards are young, similar to baby lions, the mother will leave the babies in a thick, dense vegetation, and she will go away to go and hunt. With that great camouflage that they have, it's very easy that even if danger comes by, things like hyenas, other leopards, lions, unless they pick up a scent of that baby to be able to sniff and follow them and find them into the thick bush, they can walk past those babies easily without ever knowing that they were there because their camouflage is just, just so great. However, if they start moving around, then they can break the silhouette because a lot of animals will pick up movement much faster than actually spotting something that is as camouflage as a leopard is. So in that case, the answer is yes. The camouflage coat helps the leopard to survive by making it hide.
Pandora, in the wild, no, they can't be. Beggars, beggars are not choosers. As fast as they can be, if we're talking about a cheetah, or as powerful as they can be, if we're talking about the lion, as fast and clever and camouflage as it can be, if it's a leopard, there will come a day where they will try hard to hunt and not be able to get it right. So if they are to want to choose a certain species that they want to feed on, that could result quite badly for them, that they might struggle if they walk distances and don't find the right choice for them to get. It means they can go for days without feeding. So predators, most of them are very highly opportunistic. They don't really mind as long as it's meat, they will go for it at any time. An exception to that rule would be that meat-eating animals, generally speaking, they don't eat each other. They will go for the happy force. They will kill each other as a form of competition, but they don't often eat one another. Ruthen, in most cases, that will not be possible in a way because leopards are very highly territorial. And another leopard, in, if this leopard comes across another leopard cub that's not hers, what she will want to do, the instinct will be to kill that baby leopard just so that she eliminates competition. However, in the past or in the world, strange things happen every now and again. We've heard of cases of a baboon that found a lion cub and stole it and looked after it for days. So in that case, I wouldn't say it will never happen, but it is very unusual for such thing to happen in the world. So this young female is still busy feeding. She looks like she's slowly but surely getting full. While the mother is lying on the side and starting to digest, she didn't manage to come down because the hyena moved slightly closer to the base of the tree. So I'm going to leave you over to Steve for now to go enjoy some nice kudubu while we sit a little bit here and see what is going to unfold. Welcome back to Simbambili Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands. A wonderful kudu bull. He's come out into the open to enjoy a little bit of a bush. A little bit of a bush. And now he's going to smash it a little bit with his horns. There's a red bush willow. He's a magnificent kudu, isn't he? I think he's come out for the view, to be honest with you. You don't often see kudus out in the open. Their habitat requirements are generally sort of mixed to dense bush. Out in these open areas, there are often small forbs or quite tasty plants that are available that the kudus will come out to feed on. Look at his very nimble lips there, nibbling away filling his belly with as many leaves as he can in a shorter space of time while still looking out. The wind is coming from behind him, so he'll be able to smell the approach of a predator. Possibly hear it as well with those ears, so he always look into the direction where the wind is blowing. You can't smell a predator coming from that side. So kudus are exclusively browsers. If you ever find them feeding with their head on the ground, they are feeding on forbs, wildflowers, anything quite like that, but not grass. All browsers have got an enlarged liver to help them deal with the amount of tannin 
in the diet. Isn't that a spectacular image? Those hills down there somewhere. That's about the Ulusaba side of the Saba Sands. Down to the far east, sorry, far west and south. A wonderful view. So I was saying your browsers have got a very large liver to be able to deal with all the chemicals that they ingest. Trees produce tannin to eliminate or prevent animals from eating them. And these large leafed trees that you find up on the slopes produce the tannin mainly to protect them against insects. Many of the other trees produce thorns so as to slow down the feeding rate that these animals have. Hello Shannybugs. Um, the biggest antelope actually is an eland. Elands are the biggest. And then the kudu is definitely number two, in South Africa anyway. But they are very big fellows. That kudu bull there can get up to about 300 kilograms, which is enormous. You don't think or know how big they are until you get close up. And uh, a leopard would have a very difficult opportunity at catching a big male kudu, but they do catch small uh, calves as well as uh, female kudu, and lions are the biggest predator for kudu. Big male like this doesn't have to worry too much about the smaller predators, although a coalition of cheetah would most certainly have a go. Hello AJ, you want to know the white stripes on the body? Well, the kudu is a bush-loving animal and oh, he's got an oxpecker cleaning his belly. The white stripes on the body, as well as that mane of fur on the back of his, on his back there, you see the whites on the back there? And then all the way up onto his neck, all up the back of his neck and the front of his neck and the spots on the face, can you see that? And then he's got a little stripe between the eyes as well. Now, all of those are designed to give him or to break up his three-dimensional characteristic. So when he's standing in relatively dense vegetation and you look at him, you don't see a solid body um, like a buffalo, for example, would be this round, bulky, dark shape. The kudu has got light patches and dark patches even on the belly there. He's got a fur which takes away that line. You can't really see the back outline and the fur you see on the back there where the oxpecker's sitting. The fur on the back there is almost see-through so it blends him right into the vegetation and if he stands very still you wouldn't see him often the only time i've managed to see kudu bulls in thick bush is the way that the light shines off of the horns the rest of the body invisible see the stripes on the face there if you kind of look through the bush obviously his jaws moving but if you look through the bush, the stripes and the dark con contrasting areas make the body really, really vanish. It's called disruptive markings. It is exactly what camouflage is all about. And it's obviously relative to how the animal wants to camouflage. A kudu being quite a big animal, having spots on its body like a leopard, uh, wouldn't make it blend in as well as the stripes do. A killer wants to know if you can tell the age of a kudu. Okay, let's quickly go over to a very arboreal hyena. Real life, eh? See this hyena? It's been trying hard, almost. Real life, eh? See this hyena? It's been trying hard, almost. Was standing against the tree there, 
wanting to go up, but unfortunately that's as far as he can go. I uh, not being in animal that climb trees. He did manage to get the attention of both the mother and the cub for a bit there. The cub came slightly down from the carcass and have a closer look. And the mother just put the head up and look and then she is back lying down again. It looks like the hyena is coming back down. Trying a lot of different things hoping that that carcass for some reason will fall down, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. So we're just going to hang around and see what the hyenas do. But both leopards are just lying down now. The cub has also moved away from the carcass, lying in a very safe spot in the tree there, in a nice branch, just watching these hyenas on the ground. Quite a difficult view for now where they are lying right on the foliage of the tree where they are nicely covered with the branches and that is really quite a safe thing for them because if they were lying in a patch where it's bare things like vultures might be able to spot that carcass up there but with the cover of the leaves of this particular tree there is no chance anything is gonna spot that carcass a lot of trees, if you look around, they've already started losing leaves and they're not as green. But right where we are on the bank of the Timbavati River, this, all these big trees, the tambotis, the jackalberries, still have got their full, full green leaves because of the underlying water up here. So as we watch this young one clean herself, I'm going to patiently wait a little bit more and see how it goes. And I'm going to send you over to Steve again. We're back with another kudu. There's a much younger one than the one we saw before. in the bushes and you see how if he just stands it doesn't move and if you saw in black and white you wouldn't actually see that animal and he's standing just behind the tree imagine a few more branches here or there see what I mean about the horns how they reflect the body itself though blends in so there was a question there about age and yes there is a way of aging um, I'm trying to find an image I can't find it though but uh, the horns, after three spirals, the, the bull is mature. It's at four or five years old. But um, Dr. Owen has, has always given us a very nice picture, which I've got somewhere, and I can't seem to find it. It shows you very nice aging of the kudu bulls. But they just come with a small stub in the beginning, and then they turn by the first year, and then two, three years for the second turn. And then by the time they're four, five, they've got that third turn on. And obviously the size and shape of the horns is genetic and also due to food and minerals. I wonder what a magnificent animal. So he looks, he's pretty much at the region of being fully mature. Yeah. Spectacular images of him moving down the slope.
Mm, very interesting name there, Steve Falkenbridge, fan number one. Nice to hear your your question. I don't know if kudu bulls hang out together, and they do indeed. Bachelor groups will hang out together, and you often find a whole lot of males together, but they become very territorial over females, and a very sensitive population. If you impact on a large kudu bull that is servicing a group of females, you can really impact on the successful breeding of them. Uh, the bulls will hang out together, will spar together, will play together, will look after each other, well, look after their own interests by hanging out with each other. And often you'll obviously find the younger bulls hanging out with the older bulls, but when it gets time to fight, it gets very aggressive. These guys can really, really pack a punch. How many of you know an individual that weighs 300 kilograms? What's that? 600 odd pounds now just imagine two 600 odd pound individuals hitting heads it is a, it is a goliath effort obviously they're nowhere near as big as a buffalo but very elegant but they get a very very powerful okay well i've lost some comms there but i believe i'm linking over to another elephant so we will see you just now Also very elegant and very powerful. Very true words there. Got a small herd in the stunning light. The winter light is just beautiful. Look at this trunk. I want you to notice something. You can see that this female is streaming from her temporal glands a little bit. Hi, Joshua. You'd like to know how big can a herd actually get? Well, I've seen some really massive herds. The biggest one I've seen lately was about 60. That was at Buffalo Dam. But you'll find that family groups or herds can actually be quite small, but they can also congregate because many females in a single area are related to each other and then they have their own herds because of the matriarch. And then they can come together and move away because they have sort of like think of it as an immediate family and an extended family. And then occasionally you meet up with all your extended family and but most of the time, you're actually with your immediate family. So elephants are like that too. So it can be difficult to determine whether you're seeing uh, an extended family. For example, that 60 elephant herd that we saw at Buffalo Dam. Are they all meeting up just because it's a really good resource and everybody loves water? Or is that really their immediate family or herd? So on average, I would put a herd around 20 to 30 individuals, but like I said, that's the average that we see, and they can be much larger and much smaller. Lovely sound there. I can hear what you were hearing. Sounds like bombs are being dropped, doesn't it? I'm not sure what that is. I definitely can't see the bird. If I could see it, that would help. Magpie shrikes make a similar sound, but it is not quite as high-pitched but it does sound like a cry for help, almost. Did you 
hear that rubbing. I didn't, can't see the animal, but it sounds like uh, an elephant has found a post to scratch itself on. Now we're talking about the temporal glands of this particular female. When she turns her head, you'll be able to see that she's streaming from them. And we usually associate the streaming from those glands with must in males. But in fact, males stream from those glands because they are in a stressful state. And any elephant will stream from those glands if they're feeling stressed. But not stressed in the sense that we may be used to, as in... Um, mental or emotional stress but even just um, stress on the body so maybe not getting the food that they enjoy maybe they're pregnant or there's some other hormonal changes that will cause that to happen too and that temporal gland is actually a modified sweat gland and they're quite large inside the body of an elephant. Mammary glands are also modified sweat glands. Sweat glands can do great things. Yes, they can. All right, I'm gonna send you over to Dylan, who's uh, sitting where these elephants, I'm sure, would love to be sitting. So we're sitting, Jandra and I are sitting quietly at this little wartel now. Um, and he's actually got the bird that's foraging there that's bobbing up and down like that. It's called a blacksmith lapwing. Blacksmith lapwing. And that's a youngster. Those beautiful patterns on it. The adults are strikingly black and white. But look at that reflection, eh? So that's just foraging along now. So again, we're seeing multiple kills. Okay, that's a Cape turtle dove that just came over it. So we're seeing like multiple kills as we're sitting here. So we've decided to take a different tack. Uh, our tracking team has said it's been fairly quiet on their front. So we're just going to sit at this little water hole and hopefully some stuff comes in. We should get some stuff just now. And I mean, even if it's just birds, I mean, the, the, the birding should be quite good here now. So we're just going to like wait it out. And you never know, there's a, a wildebeest across there in the far distance. And... What we've done, we've just stacked up a couple of little branches in front of us, in front of us here, just to break up our outline. And this is where it becomes really exciting, because now we never know what is going to come down. It could be a pack of wild dogs, it could be a dove, it could be anything. So this is where it gets really exciting. And we just need to have that patience again. Um, you know, sometimes I, I go into these things of like sitting with a, a very, very particular purpose. And today it's not one of those days. Today is just, let's sit quietly and see what comes to us as opposed to us going out looking for them. It's, in fact, it's often one of the best ways to do things in the bush. Just pick a spot and just observe. I think too often we tend to like, you know, one tends to like race around. And pick a spot in your garden, those of you at home. Pick a spot, one spot in your garden and put a chair down and force yourself to sit on the lawn or in the chair and without moving, just sit for 20 minutes or half an hour in your garden and just see what you can see. I promise you, you will be very, very surprised. This is a great time of day for, for bird life. Um, of course, there's always the risk attached to it of birds of prey sitting waiting. So typically what you see is there's a lot of dove activity in and out and in and out at the water now. Um, um, there's two directly across from us, or Jandre, I mean, even even across the right, you'll see there's stacks of doves drinking there now. And what happens is, when you're seeing a lot of these birds moving like this, actually at the water, they're quite relaxed in terms of the immediate threat of a raptor or a predator. But that doesn't mean there isn't a predator around you or a bird of prey. I think it's one of these one of the most common errors we make and myself included when you're in the bush you're seeing a herd of impala and they are super relaxed well they can't be predators around because the animals are relaxed now just think about the logic of that if those animals always knew when there was danger it would be a very very tough life for any kind of predator out there to actually get something to eat
and there's a, like, there's a lot of virtue um, in just sitting very quietly like we are going to do now. And I'm talking, I'll talk softly. And um, we just sit and watch, just sit and watch. And um, you never know, maybe we're pleasantly surprised. <laughs> I don't have anything up my sleeve, I promise. I'm not, I'm not playing this up. I'm actually trying to play it down now. But it is, like, it's always super cool doing this. It's like one, it's got to be one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things. Because it's like that sense of expectation. It's just like, ah, what's going to happen next? Ah, it sounds like I think it's Bonnie that has a leopard up in a tree that's grooming itself just like waking up for the, for the night, for its day. So head over that way and we're just going to sit it out over here. Yeah, we just sit here and try and position and try a different angle. Both the mother and the cub at the moment, they have not moved much. They still tucked themselves right into the thickness of this whipping bobbin that we're sitting under. And the two hyenas looks like they went up above the bank. I don't think that they would have gone too far, though. They wherever they are still keeping a very close listen to hear if these leopards drop this carcass or if they start feeding again but right now with no movement on the tree at all the hyenas have realized that chances of the leopards of the carcass falling down is very little so they went above the bank possibly to lie down as well and just patiently wait so we just still sitting here watching to see if anything changes Looks like the mother, there's a little bit of movement on the mother, on the mother's side. Repositioning, just getting a little bit more comfortable. Mm. She's on the move, or oh, if you want me to move, you let me know. I think our original position would look like gold. Or, yeah, you can now. So the mother has started moving around slightly. She's headed back towards uh, the main stem of the tree. She might be thinking either of coming down or heading back towards the carcass. So she's definitely coming down. These hyenas didn't go too far on the other side. Chances are that they might try to come back close by, in which case I think she's just going to shoot back right up a tree. Yeah, we need to move and try and position again. I think she's lying on the base. I'm going to try and <coughs> move around. See if we can get a better spot further up where we were earlier on. While we try and drive around to try and see if we can get a better place, we'll send you over to Pinda for another spotted cat. Good afternoon and welcome to and beyond Pinda Private Game Reserve. My name is Clive and behind the camera this afternoon is Marcel. And finally, finally, we have managed to find you a cheetah this afternoon. Walking straight down the road, I'm just going to move up a little bit up ahead. So it's quite late afternoon now, the sun will be going down soon. With these cheetah not wanting to move around at night, which is when their competition is moving around, like leopards and lions, he's going to probably want to find a spot to settle down quite soon, I'm hoping. We 
you're just going to give him lots of distance because he could also be, he, he, you know, he's walking along and keep looking on the left and the right. So he could actually be hunting at the moment. And just judging by the shape of his body, his stomach is not big and bloated. So I don't think he's eaten recently. Look at that, looking off to the right. Right, let's move up ahead again. So this has been a very interesting search the whole afternoon. We have done circles and circles and circles around an area quite far from here. And then luckily someone else radioed and said they had found a cheetah. And this is our main road that goes through the reserve and he was just walking along here. So we raced here as quickly as we could. And I'm so glad that we did. Okay, let's stop again here. So this cheetah, I don't know, for those of you who were watching um, last time I was on here, which was four days ago, we actually saw this cheetah, and I was explaining all about him, that he's still quite young, and I think this is the same one, and the reason I say that is, um, when we get a bit closer, you might be able to see, but he's got lots of fluff just behind his head, on the back of his neck, which means he's still quite young, and it's... I think the only young male cheetah that's off by himself at the moment, so it must be him. But look at the ground he's covering. He's already 50 meters ahead of us. Next, that's a good question. You're asking how long a cheetah can go without hunting, especially a young male like this. He has only been by himself for about maybe six months. So he's probably not, he hasn't gathered all the skills that he needs to hunt successfully very often. So he might still be a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, maybe not so good at hunting. So he might have to try and try and try over and over again before he actually comes right and, and is able to catch something. Um, and now, like he's looking quite hungry, he would still easily be able to go another two or three days without eating. But, look at he's even running a little bit now. Yeah, but uh, he's, you know, he probably is quite hungry and he is looking to hunt at the moment. Look at that, he's still running. Wonder why he started running. But overall, they can go, sure, even more than a week without eating if they have to. But they'll rather try and eat every three or four days. Also, it depends what they catch. If they catch a little scrub hare, a small little um, hare, they, you know, that's not a lot of food. Whereas if they catch an impala or a female nyala, that's a proper amount of food. And that'll last them a good few days. Anushka, you're asking what would happen if the cheetah brothers split up. So this, this one was part of a litter of four cubs. So he was one of four. Um, but when they were about around about six months old, and um, we saw them the one evening, and it was the mother and her four cubs. And the next morning, there was only one left, and that was this this cheetah here, he was the one that was left. Sorry, just going to go up ahead again. Um, so if in that litter, if there were more males, he would be with that brother right now. They would be together if they were still alive. Um, with them being killed that night, uh, there's it's only him, so he's going to be by himself for the rest of his life.
So there's beautiful big open grasslands on the right, a little bit thicker on the left, but there's a good chance of some grazing animals on the right in all this grassland. Impala, maybe zebra, wildebeest, which could be good options for him to hunt. But I don't see anything yet. And I must say he's walking like he's on a real mission. He's not he's not taking it slow. So he's walking with quite a purpose. Wow, this is really special though. It's nice to see them walking because you can see all these little adaptations that cheetah have, have evolved over the years um, of, of allowing them to be able to run so fast to catch their prey. And, you know, they've got those long legs, that really long tail, the very long slender body, very lightweight animals, and it all just helps them just sprint so fast. Anyway, we're going to carry on following this cheetah, and we're going to send you over to Trisha with some running grouse. This is one of my favorite Franklins. It's a Koki Franklin. And this female, there's a male nearby, and you can see the male has a very obvious kind of orangey mustard head. And they're sort of playing together, which is quite cute. Of course, they move off. Oh, you're back. Oh, this is a Crest Franklin. Look, where did your Koki Franklin friend go to? Let's see there. There's one moving about there. Could it be that the Crested Franklin and the Cokie Franklin were friends? Pop your head out. Well, the Cokie Franklin was having the time of its life. I'm going to move ahead just a slightly and see if we can see it. Now they are monogamous, so they usually hang out in pairs, the Cokie Franklin. Koki, Koki, where'd you go? Oh. Can we see it? Okay. Dun, dun, dun. It's some fresh... Fresh leopard scat. Oh, somebody called in some lions, but they're by the Magnoletti. I also see some tracks further ahead. Shall we have a look together? I see some there. Just on the left. So what would be ideal right now is to hear some alarm calls because we have fresh scat which is going to bode very well. See the problem with tracks is that you see tracks and you've got to make an assumption and a roundabout time about them. You see fresh scat which is still shiny, a little bit moist. Sorry for the description but it's true. And you hear alarm calls your time frame becomes a little bit smaller and smaller and smaller. So this scat means that fresh last, say, 20 minutes, half an hour, maybe an hour, but it's not dried up enough. Um, and now if we hear an alarm call, that will say right now at this moment there's an animal moving. So still smells pretty fresh. So we're going to follow up and we can go to Gallego area and see what we can do. But I'm going to send you over to Dylan for now. Apparently he's having a great Sunday. I wonder what he's up to. What a beautiful bird, eh? 
This is a, I'm just sorry, I'm just talking softly now because it's a good time for animals to come in now. It's a South African shell duck, South African shell duck. And I was absolutely blown away recently. Um, at the beginning, th so they've all had their, their, their chicks this year. So these things, the, the, the chicks have all fledged, they've moved off already. But about four months ago, three months ago, I was walking way up in the mountains. It was like this little plateau up in the hills. Well, it's still there, not was, it still is there. And in the middle of nowhere, the nearest water was probably three kilometers away. And he has these duck tracks. Da -da, da -da, da -da. And I followed them, followed them, followed them. And it was going from burrow to burrow to burrow, checking out suitable nesting sites. These birds nest underground. And they've actually been recorded almost nine meters back down the top. So that, remember, that's not nine meters vertically. Yeah, that's a tunnel that goes, follows back nine meters. That's quite far for them. But normally tunnels three, four, five meters in, in length. They nest underground like that. They lay the eggs, the little ducklings hatch inside there. And after a couple of days, they actually the, follow the parents all the way back down to the water. Now you must think... In this environment, filled with predators, that's birds of prey, it's jackals, it's caracals, it's African wildcats, it's leopards, it, it's you name it, it's out there, snakes. And these little guys have got to bring all those little ducklings safely to the water. I mean, that is quite a feat. But it's also an ingenious method of escaping predation at a water hole. So in these arid or semi-arid environments, rather, the water holes are normally very, very small. Any water points are small, and they often very, very temporary. So if you're on a small body of water, you say, well, where are you going to nest? You, it's, it's a focal point for predators. So rather, actually, instead of trying to nest close by, have your nest away from the water. Get your incubation period over. Get your chicks up and running and... When they're big enough, they can actually move around by themselves and hide, then bring them down to the water for foraging. It's, it's actually quite a clever strategy. You know, at first, your first appearance, you'd think, but that's madness. But it's not. It's very cool. The reason I'm saying this is this is a female. She's got that lovely, I mean, that obviously that lovely russet chest, but then also a grey head. The male's got this bright white head. And I'm actually surprised he's not around at the moment. I think he will make an appearance a little bit later. Um... There are two of them that are resident at this pan. So he might actually come flying in a little bit later. We'll just keep an eye open. We've, in the time that we've been sitting here, we've had a warthog that came down and drank. There were wildebeest here. So Sugar has just asked a, uh, another interesting question there about, will, you know, will lower temperatures be better for predator or prey and I don't think and again I stand to correction I don't think there'll be a huge difference um, you know either way predators are by their very nature opportunistic you yes you get your specialist predators and ones that are stationary like a, a burrowing scorpion will just sit at the entrance of its burrow um, and then it's really reliant on external temperatures which are optimal for the prey to be moving around but the nature of a predator is such that it can only catch what it's out there or what it can find, um, regardless of what the temperature is. So, in other words, if a temperature goes below a certain point and things are starting to sit down and huddle up, it's going to become more and more difficult for a predator to actually start finding prey, whether it's searching for prey um, or it's actually lying in wait as an ambush predator. Um, you get things where um, beyond certain temperature limits, Above a certain temperature, below a certain temperature, it's just not good for things to be moving around anymore. And then it becomes obviously more and more difficult for, for predators to get, get prey items. Good question. So I'm just loving the reflection of the mountains here, that reflection of the shell duck there. Nishka's just asked, do ducks fall into the bird family? Yes, they do. It's a very interesting thing there. The, yeah, they, I mean, there's no, no group of birds that don't fall into the, no group of, like, within the, 
birds like ducks or pigeons or that houtsen that we were, um, that we were chatting about earlier this morning, they don't. All of them fall within the bird group. Um, but you get a huge range in adaptations of birds. So some are, you know, very, very old or potentially very old like that houtsen. And that, that some people would say, well, well that's, just like, that's like borderline kind of dinosaur. Um, but yeah, they, they are all birds. Even chickens. Okay, there's a big kudu bull that's coming down now as well. Out to the left hand side. So this sitting sitting quietly is actually starting to really pay off now. He's just behind some some trees. He may come out he'll pop it into a field of view soon. Just give it a little bit of time. So Valerie has just asked, is this, a, is this water supplied for the animals? Uh, in other words, a piped pan or natural? And it's a combination of both. Um, in these semi-arid areas, the evaporation rate is immense. So we cannot, um, in terms of managing these systems, we cannot just keep topping water up and topping it up and topping it up to maintain this level. I mean, your evaporation rate is huge, so we would never do that. Um, so what you're seeing here, this is 95% rainwater. And this particular dam where Jandre and I are sitting now is actually underwater if we've had a good rainfall season. And the nice thing there, then we just switch off all the, all the solar panels. So we, we're not, you know, we, they come on when the sun rises and they switch off by themselves when the sun sets. But when we've got a lot of rainwater, then we just switch it off. And then it, so it's all just natural, natural water at the, at the moment. Nice big kudu bull that, eh? Yeah, so apparently Steve was chatting to his guests about how to age a kudu bull. Um, so this this bull here, you're probably looking at about seven years, give or take. You're looking at the, the turns. The turns, you know, every turn, two years, give or take, you know, every full turn. Slightly less than that. And again, you know, it also depends on your forage in the area. You know, if, if the animal's getting good quality, good quality browse. Kudus are browsers. They feed on, on leaves, twigs, thin branches. And speaking about browsers, and something I wanted to mention earlier this morning when we were talking about the Houtsun and the similarity the, the, you know, we were looking at giraffe and then we started talking about the Hudson. Now that we're talking about kudu as browsers, the Hudson is apparently the only bird on earth that is exclusively a browser. It's the only one that feeds exclusively on leaves. And, um, and they reckon that because it's got such a big crop, because it needs this whole fermentation process, because leaves are, there's a lot of cellulose in them, it's quite a, f a fermentation process that needs to take place there in order to be able to for the, the microorganisms in its gut to be able to digest the stuff um, so with that with that larger larger gut space that's kind of compromised on muscle space for wings that's one of the theories so they're not great flyers um, anyway, so that's just interesting I never knew that um, before this morning when I was looking it up <coughs> never stop learning There's a lot of bird activity around here, mostly doves, a lot of Cape turtle doves, one or two laughing doves that have come in, the shell duck obviously, lapwings. We're going to keep sitting out here and head over to the spots in the long grass. So we managed to come around onto the bank of the Timbawati riverbed where we find this mother leopard lying in the long grass. 
there is some flies bothering here every now and again you'll see her trying to hit it with her paws tail wagging and kind of wanting to jump up it looks like it's quite a big fly so we're hoping that that fly maybe will irritate her more and make her want to get up look at how see that how she nearly just killed that fly so it's quite a big one and if that fly carries on she's most likely to get up because she's not getting a piece of mine down there and there is this hyena that's right on the base of the tree now that is looking around listening to all the different sounds we're hoping that the hyena is gonna maybe head towards where the mother is maybe the mother will get up whereas the cub up in the tree the hyena is just hear the sound of impalas rutting quite far in the distance but you might hear it so the hyena is listening attentively to hear if that is a distress call another leopard maybe is killing an impala there it looks like he's figured it out that maybe there is nothing there let me look up in the tree where the where there's a little bit of food maybe i might get a piece so one of the hyenas uh, looks like has given up she could be here in the long grass somewhere where we can see as you can see how nice and thick it is down here but we're just sitting around and hoping for a little bit of action to happen with the hyena looking like it's gonna move around either down towards the mother let's just wait and see what unfolds Pond, the leopard will try her best to avoid any conflict with the hyena. The hyena is such a tough creature, holding the one of the strongest jaws of all the mammals on land. Should this leopard try to fight against the hyena, and the hyena took one bite out of a leopard, the angel, the leopard will pick up, might slow this leopard down to death, or the bite itself might kill her after infection. So in most cases, if it's about food, the leopard will rather move away from the carcass and hyena will steal it and live healthy to hunt again tomorrow. The few times that the only exceptions where you see a leopard standing a ground and ground and try and charge towards the leopard is if she's got cubs that are quite small and the hyena is getting too close too quickly, wanting just to delay the hyena so that the babies can be able to get some time to run off. In cases like that, yeah, you might look at how close that hyena just got to that leopard. See, the leopard is not moving for now because she still feels quite safe. Hyena changes her mind. She was busy growling and hissing at him. A little bit of a threat right there, which worked this time. But it's only working now because the carcass is not right close to where the leopard is. If the carcass was there, the hyena wouldn't be listening to that at all. So leopards by all means try and avoid any conflict, in particular when it has to be physical and touching each other with a hyena because they don't, they try to risk not getting any injuries. Look at how long her whiskers are. can't really see we, we, we water the whiskers there, what is the long grass right now. with the hyena this close by because the cub is not as brave as the mother yet 
So if the cup comes down and the hyena runs back up, the cup will have to run back up a tree. And it's a little bit risky really to come down now for her in particular. Right now up a tree where she is, she looks quite comfortable. The carcass is up there. I doubt she's going to come down anytime soon. So I will patiently wait for this full cat on the ground in the long grass and the cub up in the tree and the hyena in the mix. We will hand you over to Trish to see how her carnivore hunt is going, herbivore hunt is going and see what unfolds down here. We're possibly gonna join up a little bit later again. Oh Barney, it's going in circles at the moment. Just looking down into that drainage. I can hear. There's my Koki Franklin. Finally saying something. I can hear Sticklers. I really do feel that there's a leopard around here. It's just a matter of driving and driving until we see it. Problem with this drainage is it's very difficult. It's a drainage between Rebecca's Road and Western Quarantine. I'm a little upset with the Cokie Franklins. Cokie Franklin went in as soon as you came to me. Crested Franklin came out. The good old Switcheroo, they got me. Let's drive up just to the top and listen again. All right, so we're going to go to the top, listen again. Hopefully we'll be able to find our predator, but I'm going to send you over to Dylan and Swalu Kalahari. And he has some ducks that are diving. We've got a duck doing a handstand. Watch, oh look, there you go. It's doing its exercises. I think that thing's got better balance than I've got. I'll just fall straight over. So the question is, what is that duck doing? At the bottom. It's lovely to see that. It's a beautiful behavior. Her mate, her you know, partner, the, the male came in just now. So he actually flew in and he's now moved off to the left. He's on the bank. We'll have a look at him now. But look at this beautiful behavior. Bums up. Sun's down. Bums up. And it's very interesting what I find. And I'm, again, I'm just kind of like thinking off the top of my head yeah she was sitting the entire time he sorry she she was sitting the entire time on the bank not moving the moment he arrived back boom, they both she went into the water and then started feeding so i'm going to guess that looking at this feeding behavior it like kind of leaves you a little bit vulnerable to predation if you got your butt up in the air um the whole time and no one to watch out for you. So I think she waited until her partner arrived back and then she started feeding. Very, very cool to see this behavior like this. And it's cute. I mean, you, you got to admit, that is just cute, super cute. Okay, we've got an antelope coming in. We're going to move very slowly. To the right of the duck, 
I can see a shadow. I can, it's a wildebeest. I just saw the shadow moving in the distance. I was going, well, what are you? He's going to come out straight behind the duck now. There he is. Look at that. That's very cool. Very, very cool. And this is the thing. You just sit quietly. Just watch animals. And there's a second one coming out as well. It's so peaceful there. Yeah. And I'm so glad that all of you are able to actually sit and watch this with us. Sina has just asked what species of ducks are found in South Africa. So we've got a lot of species of ducks. I'd have to do a quick count um, offhand, but I don't, yeah, I, yeah, let me not do that right now. I'll come back to you, but we've got like Jish, African black duck, white back duck, um, a coa duck, knobbled or comb duck, what they call comb duck. Now you've got a spur wing goose, which is actually a duck. Um, South African shell duck, it's a duck. Egyptian goose, which is actually also a duck. You've got African pygmy goose, which is a real goose. Um, Fulvis duck, that's a cool one. Um, I don't know, so we're probably, I'm th we're probably a 10 species or so, but I'd actually have to check, give you a proper, a proper figure on how many ducks we've got. So my question is, do you think this one is ducking or diving? <laughs> So look at this genre now we're sitting out in the open we've got a <laughs> we've got a couple of we've got a couple of branch, small branches in front of us but nothing significant and you see these animals they come in they drink and they move away from the water this is really 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 nice to see this behavior and that is very 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 typical of what they do it's seldom seldom that you'll get animals that'll come down to the water and then just like idle around at the water they'll come down they'll drink and they leave or they'll come down they drink maybe they'll wallow a little bit and then they leave so what we're seeing here is a real privilege because we're just sitting observing what they would be doing even if we weren't here and that's like the real special thing here and to see these ducks just dabbling like this is just beautiful i mean it's just i can tell you if we had if we had a, if, if we'd brought our vehicle over and parked it closer these ducks would be like super wary and they'd be like watching us from a distance. So I think we're very, very lucky with what we're seeing here now. So there's the male. I'd like to say the male man, but... <laughs> so it's, the day's long and my jokes are getting weak now. And she's still busy feeding away, so he's he's obviously like kind of, or she's trusting him to keep keep an eye out for any potential predators that may come in. So special sitting like this. Okay, we've got a lot more ducks. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. We were probably about. Okay, but I'm including like the teals and the pintails and all the weird things. You're probably looking at about 17, 18 species. I was just doing a quick check there. has just asked a question I do not have a clue but I'm going to try to find out the question is do ducks know how many days of winter are left by monitoring their shadow um, mm, I don't know about that um, they certainly have you know the a lot of animals function their circadian rhythms function on daylight hours um, you know whether that's an inbuilt clock or inbuilt meter, which is 
pretty much what it would be. Um, or if they're actually looking at the environment and, and like a shadow and calculating, okay, well, my shadow is X length, therefore there are X amount of days of winter left. I, I would guess not, but not being a duck and a duck shadow expert, I'm, I, I'd have to check that up, but I will definitely check that up. It's, it's a really cool question. Just lovely to see these shell, duck, shell ducks just doing what they would be doing any any day. I mean, just oh, look at that! Good little wing wing flick there. So a lot of these birds will actually roost on the water. They'll they'll just sit and tuck their head into their wing, and they'll just sit floating on the water. Because one of the the nice things about a body of water like this, it's not particularly deep. I mean, you could walk through this it would take you at the deepest down uh, up to knee high but a, a large body of water like this well for us it's a large body of water <laughs> relatively of course it retain a lot more heat in the super cold times of the night as opposed to the actual land um, so by actually sitting floating on the water they'll probably not get as cold than as if they were trying to huddle on the land somewhere and of course it, it, it reduces the likelihood of, of a predator getting in. You know, if they were sitting out on the bank somewhere, trying to hide like that, um, there's a stronger likelihood of being, being eaten by someone. Something. Like my head has just asked a question, why don't you get a lot of vegetation around a wattle? And it's what we call, the, the, the term for it is what we call a piosphere, P-I-O-S, P-H-E-R-E, piosphere. And that is, in essence, it's the, the area of game impact around that water body. So you do get some areas, if you've got a lot of water and it's permanent water, which this isn't, remember this isn't permanent water, this this will end up being a tiny little puddle that will actually top up um, every day going forward. So this, what you're seeing is not a permanent body of water. But a permanent body of water, you can get thick, rank vegetation growing around it, grass, reeds, all those kind of stuff. And you'll get game paths or patches that are bare where animals come down to drink. In a semi-arid environment like this, um, because this water just disappears to next to nothing, that, you know, there, there's very, very, very little, if any, opportunity for vegetation to actually take hold around a water body like this. And there's constant animals moving in it. When I say constantly, you know, at various times of the day, obviously. Um, it's not like we're sitting here seeing, like, hundreds of animals coming to drink. But there's always some form of animal movement around a body of water like this. And that was... Uh, buffer thorns around the water bodies. Yo, the temperature's starting to drop now. I don't think it's going to be as cold tonight as it was last night. Oh my word, I'm getting asked brilliant questions this afternoon. How fast can ducks swim underwater? I have absolutely no idea. But again, I would be very interested to know the answer to that if anyone's actually done tests on that because, you know, ducks typically, and I, again, you know, again, I'm not a duck expert, ducks typically are foraging underwater for small invertebrates, water vegetation, that kind of stuff. So they probably don't have a huge need and, and they're normally dabbling in other words like what that female was doing earlier just bobbing up and down like that so they probably don't have a huge need to fly that fast underwater uh, I think like your masters of underwater hunting or uh, you know things like gannets boobies those kind of things who are actually diving into the water and they're actually using their wings um, as essentially as fins underwater and they can get uh, get to quite fast speeds um, 
but ducks aren't typically known for being super fast underwater. Ah, oh, there's going to be a cool sighting. There's a hippo with something on it down there with one of our colleagues. But go have a look at that and we're going to keep our eyes peeled down the side. Welcome back, everyone. And what better way to spend a Sunday evening than watching a pod of hippos at this beautiful watering hole with sunset in the background. It cannot get better. I'm going to keep my voice away from you for... An I'm just, let you know. I'm just going to keep quiet for a minute. Now, if that doesn't make you want to be spending your afternoon in Africa, then I don't know what will. <laughs> this is like a perfect, perfect scene here. I know Marcel has been um, zooming in on that bird that's literally just been riding around on the hippo's back. It looks like it's walking on top of the water. Because the funny thing is that you can't even see the hippo there. <laughs> Beautiful colour on the water as well, reflecting off the sky. So with these hippos being nocturnal, as soon as the sun is down completely and it gets a bit darker, they're actually going to leave the, leave the water and go off and feed. And they will go for most of the night. And then they'll be back here again before it's light again in the morning. Normally to the same watering hole, but a few of them might actually split up and go to different watering holes. So there's a very interesting scene unfolding at Pridelands with Taylor. We're going to send you across there quickly. There is indeed. Sorry we've been gone for so long, but we are back with some members of the Pridelands clan. There's one having a big stretch. Now, we've counted at least eight adult hyenas that have been moving through this long grass, and they're not here for no reason. You can see how they are tentatively looking down into the drainage line. And that is because those two young male lions that we have seen every now and then have made a small buffalo kill. I haven't seen the lions yet and I haven't seen the kill just yet, but I thought it would be a great opportunity for us to just have a look at the hyenas because this is the most adult hyenas I've actually seen together since the last incident where the lions and the lionesses, I mean the lionesses and the hyenas had a bit of a row, so... This is quite exciting. They haven't really started hassling the lions just yet. They're just sort of sitting about. I, I think they're preparing themselves. They would have maybe been resting nearby in a drainage line. This one's, they've all been having big stretches, yawning, waking up. And if they're going to face two male lions, they all better come together. They're not going to be able to take them on by themselves. So please remember, if you can help me, I've tried to take a couple of pictures, grab those screenshots, hashtag Wild Earth, share them, as we are desperately trying to put together a family tree of all the hyenas of the Pridelands clan. This is actually such a beautiful scene with the tall grass. Rory, oh yes, uh, hyenas are actually very successful hunters. 
Um, unfortunately, there is a myth about hyenas that they are just merely poor scavengers that steal things from other predators, when in fact they are su very, very successful when it comes to hunting. So they use a very different strategy. Um, they uh, don't necessarily stalk up to their prey. They have got incredible stamina. So they'll run after them and they'll work together uh, as a unit and bring down large prey. They just bite and bite and, you know, eventually they grow, ti grow tired and they will sort of bring their prey down. This hyena's walking right up to the car. In one moment I thought it was going to come into the vehicle. It's Look, it's right at the vehicle. Hello? Yes. Would you require some assistance to get your dinner? Maybe. So I am still looking out for one of the hyenas, one of the females, uh, that has a blind left eye, but I haven't seen her for ages. So here's a great moment to get some close-ups of a hyena. I'm looking for any markings, any particular patterns, anything like that would be really helpful. This is really lovely. You can see a couple of scars on the back of the ears, but hyenas are particularly rough with one another. Wow, you're really standing right next to me. But after this, we will go closer and try and find those lions. But I am enjoying the scene um, from the distance, watching the hyenas go back and forth, back and forth, trying to figure out which is going to be their best angle. Whether they may go in there or not, I suppose we'll only have to... We'll only be able to wait and see. Normally, two, two big male lions is quite... Well, they're not fully grown, but it's quite daunting. They're much bigger than the girls. And they could definitely put up a fight, except one of them is injured. Noriko hyenas are strictly carnivores, but what you will see every now and then, and you see it with leopards, you see it with lions, you see it with wild dogs, you might even see it with your cats and dogs at home, is that occasionally um, these predators will ingest small amounts of grass and that's normally to try and induce vomiting. Perhaps they've got too much hair in their stomach or they've eaten something um, that's not particularly pleasant but it's basically to just try and vomit something up but uh, it's not because they're all of a sudden craving spinach or anything like that. Their digestive systems aren't able to digest the cellulose in plants and that's why they need to feed on prey species, so herbivores, that are able to turn those carbohydrates and cellulose and all those wonderful things into a protein that they can then feed on. So you can see them, they're, they're walking around, they're very unsure as to what to do, they've kind of split up now, and maybe they're just sussing out the area, just figuring out, like I said, which angle they're going to maybe make an attack from, or Hyenas are very good at playing the patience game. They could probably also just sit and wait until the lions go for a drink or if they are done with their meal, then they'll definitely go on in and um, happily pick up all the scraps. But we're going to move around now and try and get a position and a view of those lions off we go across to Pinda that are frolicking about with some hippos. And welcome back again. We just actually too beautiful to move away from. So we stayed. <laughs> and I'm glad we did because now we've got a challenge. We are going to sit here. Okay, so at this time of the afternoon, these, before the hippos kind of get out the water and go feeding, they are waking. and start it, they yawn a lot. So our challenge now is to try and catch one on the video yawning. So let's hope. But how beautiful is this scene? We just apologize for the, the audio there quickly. Um, we've linked to us. We're going to try and get a dove. I've got a question for the audience. Maybe someone out there can help me. 
because I've asked so many people and, and I've looked it up and I cannot get an answer for this. I want to know is if you look at so many birds when they drink, they, they, they scoop water, okay? When doves drink, they don't scoop water. They put their whole mouth, half their face, and they actually like suck water. Why? I want to know, why do doves do that? And I don't know if you can see any of these doves at the moment. You got them, so you see when they're drinking, they put their head into the water and they actually suck water. Other birds come down and scoop. I, I'm i thinking, I'm guessing it may have something to do with, um, there's lots of doves, which means that they're probably high on the predators. Let's just, you know, typically animals in large numbers get eaten a lot. So if you know you like, well, geez, you high on the menu in this area, there's lots of aerial predators. Maybe to get your enough water intake and you're sitting scooping water, it's going to take you a while. So you rather get in there, get your head down drinking, and you're normally with other doves. So you're not all drinking at the same time. So there's that like, trade-off between vigilance and being able to get your water and try to get in and out as fast as possible. But I don't know. That's, that's me absolutely thumb-sucking a theory there. So if anyone knows why doves would drink the way they do as opposed to scooping water like other birds, please feel free to... Um, let us know. I'd be very interested to hear any opinions on that. We ha we've had a, while we've been sitting here, we've had another big wildebeest bull that came in and drank, and he's just moved out about two, three minutes ago. So there's some nice things happening, and he was also very alert down towards the south of us, so maybe there's something else on the way. And this is where it gets so much, so fun. It gets so fun and so cold so quickly. <laughs> The sun's like, now we're sitting in the shade here, and the temperatures are... Mm. But we'll, we'll be brave. Chandra, don't cry. Just wipe those tears. <laughs> we're going to get something. There's going to be something else coming in again soon, 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 soon. a lot of dove activity and these doves can come can, so we've got a really interesting bird that comes down to drink after dark so unfortunately we're going to miss that but they're called sand grouse and hopefully we'll be able to show you um, if we're very lucky you might get the first couple coming in just before close today but um, normally they'll come in a little bit later they're called double banded sand grouse and they it's kind of a dove sized bird and they nest up in these mountains get little chicks and they'll fly down after sunset and before sunrise they'll drink. Um, so if we're very, very lucky, we'll see them and hear their calls really, really pretty. Um, but while we're waiting for them, head back down to our colleagues and see what they got. So we're still sitting with the same leopard from earlier. You can see she is in the long grass, but it's getting dark quite quickly, and we are now using infrared. And the reason why we're doing that, we're avoiding to use the spotlight, which if we use the spotlight directly, some clever animals like hyenas, sometimes they will see us going off-road and see that light and start making their way. And more so that particular light, it's quite bright and harsh on these animals' eyes, and that's why we are trying to avoid using that light but with infrared as much as getting dark too quickly we can still be able to watch this leopard we have just lost the view of the cub up in the tree because it's just moved slightly further back towards where the carcass is and as for the hyenas they're still moving around you can hear some calling on a far off distance but we're just gonna sit here with this infrared light and wait to see without putting any of them in disadvantage by putting putting the bright light.
Shani, it, <coughs> there are some certain trees that you'll see leopards climbing more than others, but of course they prefer a tree where they will be able to climb and find a horizontal branch to be able to balance the carcass. Some individual leopard over the years of knowing their territory quite well, they sometimes every now and again, if they kill close enough to the tree they used before, they might drag the carcass towards the tree that they know and how nice and safe it will be for the carcass. However, they're not going to go out of their way to take it too far because that improves the risk of them coming across other predators before they put it in, in a safe place. So, yeah, partly yes, partly not. Okay, so as we await a little bit longer here before we wrap up, we're going to send you to Taylor to come and see some interaction with Buffalo and line. Well, lots of action on your screens this afternoon, including here at Pridelands. So we've managed to find a, a good spot to cross the drainage line. And as you can see, we're looking at a dead buffalo and a young lioness. And we've been seeing this young lioness, just quick views of her every now and then. It's weird. She just um, she doesn't want to live with the pride at all. So she wanders uh, just sort of east of Leopard Dam and the drainage line. Uh, seems to be where she lives. So she's joined up with the two young males and has now got a nice full belly as they've feasted upon this buffalo. I don't know if they made this kill today, this morning. We drove around here and we didn't see any vultures sitting up on the trees, which there definitely have been vultures up on the trees. So maybe they, maybe they killed something this morning and we just missed it. Uh, that is definitely a possibility. It looks like a, maybe a, a bull that they've killed. So the male lions have just moved a little bit further away. We can't see them right now, but what you also can't see is that there are a few hyenas that are coming in from behind that buffalo. And they're moving closer and closer. So it's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens here. I'm just listening because I thought I heard some growling, but I'm not sure if it is growling. I think that these hyenas are going to chase, try and chase these uh, lions away. I think that young lioness will run for her life, and it'll be interesting to see what those males do, because one is injured and he, he struggles to walk, so I don't know if he's going to try and put up a fight. And then, of course, the other male, he's fit and healthy. Here's a hyena here. I'm going to put a, a bit of light on. So just up in front. Just Sorry, it's getting a little bit dark. But just through those trees is a hyena. You might be able to see. There we go. It's just sort of standing there. You'll see how well camouflaged hyenas are too. Not that they're trying to hide themselves right now. They're just getting braver and braver. They're clever hyenas. They don't just launch into an attack. They're highly intelligent creatures, and they suss out the situation. I think that they definitely weigh up their options. And I think that they see that the male lions are not sitting right close to the carcass. But even this hyena looks like it's sneaking, right? Being very, very careful about where it puts its feet. Never underestimate these animals. They're one of my favorite predators. In this sort of greater Kruger ecosystem, we're very fortunate to have a healthy population of hyena. And we often see them interacting with other predators. I haven't ever seen hyenas hunting for themselves on the Sabi Sand, but it's also very dense here. The vegetation is quite thick. But I've seen kudu sprinting away from them and alarming at them. In East Africa, it's really not uncommon to watch hyenas hunting buffalo, hunting hippo. It's actually quite extraordinary, in fact, but the clans get much larger. But I'm surprised. The Pridelands clan of hyenas is much bigger than I anticipated. So 
This is, <laughs> this is really, really exciting stuff. And hear how quiet the bush has gone too. Just sort of some crickets in the distance. Where are the other hyenas? So it's just this one. Sorry, I'm just having a look because there were so many over here. Before we drove in, they obviously started moving around. There must have been about five or six hyenas just on the edge here, but they've all all split up so i wonder if we're just going to all come in at different ang angles and then just charge in and then hope that it causes mass confusion and the lions run away what are you going to do hyena very different setting to when the hyenas were angry with the lions the one evening and how vocal they were being. Oh, like they're on stealth mode. And going back, maybe not happy with the side. You can see pop popping its head up every now and then, smelling the air. You can definitely smell the carcass. It doesn't smell rotten. It just smells like a dead animal. You will also hear a vehicle in a minute. There's uh, some very excited students. Oh, there are the other hyenas. You see them across the drainage line. I'm just going to put a light on them. I'm going to join up now. But there's uh, still some students doing their assessment drives. And how is this for a sighting? To have this. There we go. So now we've got three hyenas just on the other side of the drainage. I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about when I say drainage line. So there's actually a riverbed that runs just on the other side and it goes sort of into a leopard dam so we're not far from the water's edge hey hyena you know what you're gonna do maybe just taking a wider berth Maiden, I wish we had a better view of the hyena, but I think you got just of what they're looking. Uh, oh, here's one coming, actually. Another one coming straight towards us. So there's going to be four hyenas very close by. It's just over there. I'm just going to drop the light for a second. Um, so essentially, I was just talking about how hyenas have incredible stamina. So if you r look at this vine, you, you can see that it is slightly curved. There's another hyena just popping up behind them. So how many did I say? Five hyenas now coming into this area. Um, and essentially, they've almost like got a sloping back, if you will. They've got very well adapted shoulders, and then their hindquarters kind of look a little bit pathetic, if you will. But this allows them to run for very long distances and to continue that up without having to put uh, too much energy. Uh, into sort of running around, if that makes any sense. It's kind of like how you see it with uh, hartebeest and sesebe and wildebeest. They almost have this rocking horse motion when they run, which is exceptional. And they just go and go and go. And hyenas are so strong. I've seen them carrying, again in East Africa, just we got to spend so much time with wild earth at one point up in East Africa. It was actually um, out of this world. Um, and one day I'll never forget watching a hyena carrying half a hippo leg and just running with it as if it was it weighed absolutely nothing. So the hyenas are obviously not in the best view, but you know how it goes. You can see I'm not really putting much of the spotlight on them, not that this minds them. We just don't have an infrared light right now, so I'm just sort of lighting it up a little bit. There we go. We are going to see one of the students coming through now. This is so cool. Man, I can't imagine how exciting it must be as a student to, do, to view something like this. Tammy, hyenas have got an unbelievable um, sense of smell. Should we have a look at this lioness? Sorry, I'm just going to put a little bit of light in her. Um, so all the predators have got an exceptionally well-developed um, sense of smell. So... Uh, they're able to pick up the scent of a dead animal or a prey, of course, from a long, long, long way away. 
it also will depend on which way the wind is blowing. If they're downwind of something, you can imagine that they could probably pick up their smell for a couple of hundred meters, maybe to even a kilometer or two. I'm not exactly sure. I'm sure that they are with tech. Again, I always talk about how technology is developing. They'll probably be able to do more accurate testing. Um, on, on something like that. So give it a few years and uh, maybe you'll have an exact answer. Or perhaps there's a study that's really done that I just haven't read about it. But it's definitely from a, a long way away. But it's not just the smell that they will use. There's other signs in the bush too. For example, the vultures that I was just talking about. They perch themselves up on the trees like that. These animals learn. They know that that means that something is up. And lions will go investigate. Uh, hyenas, leopards... If those vultures are circling and start diving down to one point, they'll run in there. And I've seen I've seen lions get up from being asleep and just noticing the vultures diving and sprinting in the direction to find that, you know, there is a carcass or there is another predator killing something, you know. And then, of course, they're hearing sounds. They're listening out for their prey to or distressed, uh, distressed calls. Right, we are going to sit patiently and hold thumbs that something exciting happens here. I think it will if we go to Dylan in Swalu, who's got a <laughs> water skiing insect. So, Jandre and I, we've just been we've just been sitting, marveling at this gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous little sighting we got here. Here we're sitting, waiting for cool birds or mammals to come down. Or anything else and yet right in front of us there's this absolutely beautiful display of insect life and all these little they're kind of like pond skaters i'll actually have to actually catch a couple of specimens and just see exactly what they are but they're all over the water surface here and they've been out i guess mating and foraging but now they're coming in this a lot of them are sitting on that branch that you can see there as it's getting cooler they're starting to gather over there so again it'd be interesting to come back here well after dark and see if that's actually what they do that they sit still um on one spot but these are the little things that the blacksmith lapwings have been eating remember we've seen it we, we've done it a couple of times watching these lapwings walking 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 on the edge of the water and just catching one thing after another after another after another um and it's these little guys that they're gobbling up that so just shows even even seeing at a water hole you know you don't have to be focused necessarily on the big stuff you know what to call the big and hairies you know there's a lot of really cool little things interactions going on all the time and what i mean what a setting i look at that is just so symmetrical wow and we're not going to move the camera because it's just so delicately placed there but in front of us every single little twig sticking up on the edge of the water has got clusters of these little skaters sitting on them now it just shows what, what amazing food resources the one thing in the Kalahari and it's very 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 prominent some of you may have noticed that with the armored ground crickets that we've been looking at over the past couple of weeks how their numbers are beginning less and less and less if you're looking at these little skaters these pond skaters here their numbers are also going to decline rapidly and not just due to temperature but um things like your your these outbreaks are often related to rainfall um and a lot of the organisms in the Kalahari are super, super well adapted to being able to respond at extremely short, uh, in, in extremely short time frames in, uh, to rain. So you get a good rainfall period, poof, and the things start going for it. Um, if you look at sociable weavers, they can actually, you know, we think of birds, how oh, they've got a set breeding time. But sociable weavers, actually, they can breed at any time of the year, depending on a rainfall shower. So it's <clears throat> generally accepted 20, 20, 25 moles of rain can trigger a breeding out, outbreak and, well, a breeding burst in social weavers. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, and that will be directly linked to the availability of food. So if there's a shower of rain, you get these little insect outbreaks, which means that they can start, the birds can start breeding, laying eggs, and then um, have got enough food to feed the chicks. So it all works super, super well. 
Uh, excuse me, I think I'm allergic to snakes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think while I'm dealing with my snake phobia, I'm, I don't have a snake phobia, I'm just kidding. Um, head over to Steve in Juma and see what he's got for you. Hello everybody, welcome back to Simbambili. We have been on Simbambili the whole afternoon. I went all the way to the far southwest to where Simbambili meets with Ottawa, which is joined with the Singita uh, property. And that area, Ottawa, is where the little chief, or not so little anymore, Hosanna, hangs out. And we went to go see if we could maybe get a glimpse of him. Fortunately, we didn't and found ourselves in some very bad signal for quite some time but right on the boundary we had a really good signal so that's promising if we do happen to find him right on the boundary at the southwestern corner we'll be able to put him on camera but um fortunately that was not to be wonderful little river systems where the pungwe river flows or should I say a nice big dry river system with some ginormous jackalberries and riverine vegetation. It was really quite spectacular down there. But with all the little depressions, uh, it gets difficult to broadcast signal. So I do apologize for that. The temperature has dropped quite considerably. Back at that pan that we started the afternoon off at shortly and who knows if something's come down to drink Hello Patricia, you want to know if it rains in winter here? Not normally much, it's not supposed to rain, but we do get out of season rain. Uh, but it's, this is regarded as a summer rainfall environment. The savannas have evolved with summer rainfall. But uh, last year in uh, June we had a little bit of rain. Uh, maybe it was July, I can't remember. Very out of season though. Very out of season. Majority of the rain falls between October and February, March. So we call it the, the wet versus the dry season. We're in the middle of the dry season now and we had some really good rains before. So the watering holes are looking great. The vegetation is still looking pretty good. Compared to the last couple of years where we had pretty bad drought. Okay, very good. We're going to carry on slowly back and send you back over to Prylins with Taylor and her sleepy lioness.
you're going to hear a noise. It's not the thundering roars of a lion or the whoops of a hyena. There is a big train that has come from Palabora that will be passing Hood Spray. So please just mind the, uh, the sound. It should be over shortly. Business as usual. But one of the young male lions, and it looks like the, the boy that's normally a little bit nervous. You can see he's got the smooth ears and that cut just next to his left eye. That's what I can just see. Just He's come out of the bush and is, and is now laying closer to the buffalo, which I think is wise. Because if they sit too far away, there's definitely going to be a problem. I can also hear trees being pushed down by elephants not far from us too. So essentially, we've got lions. We have a buffalo. It's not alive anymore. We've got hyena and the elephant. So three out of the big five in one sighting. And then, of course, those wonderful hyenas. Again, sorry, that's just the train coming past. Now, Christina, this is something we're still figuring out the dynamics, but from what I understand is that these males that we're looking at here, the two young boys that we've seen before, originate from a pride which we've now decided on a name called Ngati, which essentially means blood, and it's because this pride of lions is ruthless. Um, and those are the lionesses that we've also been seeing and it's also this little lioness that we saw just sitting here she also comes from the pride um so they're all quite spread out at the moment they are supposedly from that same pride but were pushed out by two big males that have come in from the klesiri and those males are the same males that have eaten a lioness from the Ngati pride. So we not, I'm not actually sure how many lionesses are just uh, left at the moment. Um, it, it's quite confusing because we haven't seen them all together. But who knows what's going to happen tomorrow morning. We saw the lionesses uh, yesterday morning. We had their tracks moving around everywhere. So we know that they're around here. And they could just be doing circles trying to also find themselves a buffalo. But if they do manage to come towards Leopard Dam to perhaps have a drink, there's kind of two drinking spots. It's the dam at camp, which they haven't come to yet, and this is another main drinking point on Pridelands. They will most certainly get the whiff of this buffalo and then join and uh, maybe even join these boys. These, these males were seen with the, with the lionesses uh, almost a week ago, but they've moved on. Big yawn. And that young lioness has actually just moved around. She, I think she was feeding on the buffalo every now and then. You can see the buffalo moving around. I promise it is definitely dead. Let me just change this one. There, you can sort of see it. So we've got some bushes, but I don't really want to move around too much. It's quite thick in here. And there's also lots of holes around. So you can see, very typical of lions, when they start feeding on a buffalo, they just open up the stomach, pull out all the stomach contents, and then start gorging themselves. I think that the amount of hyenas that are coming in at the moment, so we saw seven, at least saw seven adults, and we saw two other hyenas coming in from Leopard Dam, so that's nine adult hyenas. So Shaq, I think that those hyenas could actually do a good job and push them off. The lions are at a slight disadvantage. There's one fully functional male, and then there's one very small lioness, and another male lion, and these boys are obviously nowhere near being fully grown just yet, and he's injured. So I think that if they come in here and they all stick together, they might be able to chase these lions off. If they were fit and healthy male lions, they might need a few more reinforcements. But look at the strength of this male, even though he isn't fully grown just yet. He's trying to tug at the buffalo. It's actually quite, I was saying earlier, it's very eerie watching them through all these branches. So his stomach is quite distended now, so he's definitely been feeding. We've been talking a lot about digestive systems of various animals, and actually, the other, I think it was this morning, we were talking about obesity in wild animals and how you very rarely see it. They just obviously go plump during the summer months. Now you can see how fat a lion can get 
wait till we see them in the morning if they still hold on to this buffalo. They'll look like they've swallowed a beach ball. And then they'll sleep it off, and then they'll eat, and they'll sleep and eat, and so the cycle goes. I think we might just be a little bit too far away to hear them tearing into the flesh of that buffalo. Every now and then you can hear the odd sound. I don't want to go to bed. I want to stay here all night and see what happens. I'm also not sure where all the hyenas are right now. But again, they've been sleeping, they've been resting. Maybe they are waiting for reinforcements to come on in. There's been very little... Very little um, vocalizations from them so that, that's making me think I wonder if they did kill this buffalo earlier again I haven't really seen how much they feasted on but it's a decent meal I would imagine that it was the two boys that brought this buffalo down I don't think that that little lioness would be able to bring down a fully grown buffalo. You might have been able to have heard some chewing noises. It also sounds like the elephants are coming this way. Actually, it looks like that, does that male have an injury on his back leg on the inside? Let's see if he steps away. You see on his Oh no, the shadow of the buffalo's face is there. Get out. I can just see like a little black mark, and I'm wondering if he has got a bit of a gash now. I'm sure you can see what I'm talking about. It's his, it's his back right leg. Or it could just be blood or something. No, that looks a little bit like a wound. But they do get injured when they bring animals like this down. Mitmat Moo, lions are, are fairly sociable creatures, and no, in fact, they're very sociable creatures. Let me rephrase that. What is next to me? Sorry, I'm going to take the light off, Chad. I just want to see what's happening to my left. You heard that, eh? Hey? Yeah. There's lots of, lots of rustling going in on down here. I don't know what's coming towards us. Okay, sorry. I just had to check very quickly to see what was happening. Let's go back to the... I'll take us back to the lines. Um, so essentially, when a pride of lions, so say a, a group of lionesses with their youngsters or sub-adults or males, they'll all kind of eat at the same time. But if there are any big males around, they're going to try and take preference. They literally throw their body weight around and power and will, and will move, especially the youngsters, off of the carcass. Um, but in this case, I think that they're all quite happy to share. Oh my goodness, there's elephants coming in. That's what that sound is. I can't put the spotlight on the elephants, I'm afraid. But basically in front of my car where we watch those hyenas coming towards us, they're just feeding in the distance. They're maybe about 60 meters away from us. There are so many elephants on Pridelands, it's fantastic. So if it's not the hyenas that are going to come in and cause a stir, it's definitely going to be the elephants. And I think that they've probably picked up on the scent because they're downwind of those lions. And they'll come charging in here, chase everybody away, and then who knows? Perfect opportunity for the hyenas to run in during all that commotion and grab a mouthful of meat. Well, what a very exciting afternoon it's been with leopards, lions, hippos, elephants. We look forward to doing it again. We'll see you tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Safari.